Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone, to Alpha Beta Soup. I'm TXMC. Today's video will be focused on inflation. There are several different factors weighing on the inflation saga, which will be an important part in what happens to the economy over the next few months and possibly a couple of years. There's enough going on here that I feel like we could devote an entire episode to it. So we're going to do that today. We won't be talking about price action or shorter term market movements. We're going to focus on what's going on with rising costs, what's driving them higher, and what might impact the way that this saga plays out over the coming few months. If you enjoy this content, make sure to give my video a thumbs up and please subscribe to the channel. Now we have many things to discuss, so let's get into it. You're looking at my screen right now, and we're checking out the Consumer Price Index year over year. That is the default way that we tend to measure inflation. In an annual rate of change terms, it's at 8.5% for July. It came down from 9.1% in June, which was a high going back all the way to 1981. And there are a lot of different inputs to the CPI calculation. There are different aspects of the economy that play a role in how quickly it rises or falls at different points in the cycle. And right now, there is a potpourri of nonsense making this value rise quickly and stay elevated. So the reason I really wanted to talk about this today is because I've been thinking about how to encapsulate all the different ways that I see inflation being impacted. And I got a question about the most recent video that really inspired me to go ahead and make this video. Dragon Warrior on Twitter replied to my post from my last video saying, I would have liked to hear your thoughts around inflation dropping in the months ahead. Instead, you only talked about high inflation as if it won't decline. Now that's a fair point, so let's spend some time talking about CPI. The first thing that we really need to look at is what will happen to CPI if it stops changing, right? So the way that we measure it is in year over year percent of change terms. So if the value of all items in the consumer basket, if the total prices that everything people are spending on stop going up and don't go down and they stay flat, CPI would read at 0% if it went on for 12 months because the year over year change was nothing. Prices stayed exactly where they were before. When we have periods of low inflation, it usually means we have a low positive rate of change. Here on my chart, my history for this particular visualization only goes back to 2019. But you can see that even when we had a lower inflation period back here before COVID really hit, the positive change to prices was still one to two to three percent per year. Prices are kind of always going up. Now, because of the rapid rate of change over the last 18 months, CPI hit 9.1 in June. But curiously, if we were to assume that all future prints for the rest of the year were flat and the value of all of the products in the consumer basket stayed even from now till, let's say, Christmas, then the CPI would fall month over month based on how much it's already gone up in the last 12 months. And by the time we got to December, assuming that prices had stayed flat from now till Christmas, CPI would still show a 6.3% reading because prices, by the time we get to December, if they hadn't changed, still up 6% more than they were last Christmas. Does that make sense? So the rate of change is the derivative of CPI that we care about. It's not the nominal price of the items, it's how quickly they are changing. Because in the economy, for the most part, rate of change is more important than absolute values. How quickly various aspects of the economy change has a significant role in the stability of the economy, the ability for it to weather those changes, continue to see growth, etc. So the first thing to really establish from looking at this chart is that if nothing else changed from now to the end of the year, we would still have six points. 0.3% inflation. That is a value well above the Fed target of 2%. The only way that we would get below a 6% CPI by the time we got to Christmas of this year is if prices in the consumer basket actually came down. Not only stopped going up, but actually fell if we got actual deflation. It's possible that we get that. That usually occurs when you have complete demand destruction or you have a glut of inventory, a burst 
burst of new supply that overweights the existing demand. Those are the ways that prices come down. One of the things that really plays a big role on CPI are food prices. The two most volatile parts of CPI are energy and food. Right now we're going to talk about food. In this black line is CPI for all food and beverages year over year up here at the top. The red line are protein rich foods, meat, poultry, fish, and eggs. Those are vital components of the food makeup, of the food basket. Protein rich foods are necessary for human survival. They also tend to be more volatile than the entire basket of food. As you can see here, the red line moves a lot more than the black line, but the black line moves a lot more than the rest of the CPI basket. So this is a very volatile piece of it. And you can see over here, total food costs over the last year are still up 10 and a half percent. And even in the month of July here, they printed a higher value than they did in June. They've actually gone up a small amount. Now, protein rich foods, they have come down a little bit. That particular sector of the economy has seen a slowing down of prices. But remember, the way that we measure CPI is a year over year rate of change. So when that rate of change slows down, as long as it is still above zero, it's still a positive change. It still means that prices are going up. And in this case, they're still rising at a relatively quick pace compared to history. If you zoom in on the indexes of these prices themselves, I'm going to zoom in even further so you can get a really close look at this. This black line represents all food. And as I mentioned to you, it has not softened. It is still pointing straight up. So we haven't seen this slowdown at all yet. Protein rich foods, you can see how they kind of crested here. There was a small pullback and they didn't set another slightly higher high from where they were in May. That caused the rate of change to come down and smooth a little bit. But you can see the prices have not fallen. They're not coming down. They aren't getting less expensive, which would be deflation. So if this trend continues, if we don't see food prices significantly falling, then that will continue to put tailwinds and upward pressure on the CPI calculation. Another aspect of the food situation that I don't think gets enough coverage by the news organizations is what's going on with crop quality. So we've talked about before how Russia is a major exporter of critical resources, including ammonia, which goes into fertilizers. And there has been a global rush to acquire fertilizer. It's been difficult. The prices have gone through the roof and many farmers are finding it difficult to get enough fertilizer to produce the yields that they're accustomed to. And because of droughts in various parts of the world, those fertilizer shortages will become even more acute as they play exponential havoc on yields. So what we're looking at here is a chart from grainstats.com. They report U.S. crop yields and they report on qualities and expectations. Now all four of these components are critically important to U.S. agriculture. Corn goes into everything. We also use it as a sweetener, as a sugar substitute. It's also used to produce ethanol, which is a fuel. Sorghum, which is a type of cereal grain that is used in a lot of animal feeds, and they can even use it as a fuel source. So there is a lot of importance in these four items right here. Each of these charts represents good to excellent condition historically year over year for each of these four items. Now this dark blue line is 2022. This is the sorghum good to excellent condition percentage from May to now for this year compared to all years prior. Look at that. Here's a look at cotton. Here's 2022, this blue line down here. Look at that below all previous years on this series. This is corn. See this blue line here that's following my mouse cursor? It's been in decline month on month on month, and it's now down here below all years in the series. Almost down to 50% of the corn crop is considered good and excellent condition. That is not good. And lastly, a look at soybeans. Here it is in this blue line. Not quite as bad as the other three, but only two other years in the last nine have seen worse crop conditions for soybeans than the current year. So I'm concerned that these effects here will play another role in lifting food prices and allowing them to stay sticky and elevated and more volatile. Because if you don't have enough quality yield, you don't produce the volume of these crops that are necessary, you will not meet demand. And what that will do is drive up prices as people fight over the existing inventory. 
So as far as food goes, as we looked at protein-rich foods, we looked at the rate of change, and we're now seeing the quality of crop yields looking kind of suspect, I'm starting to wonder how sticky these food prices might actually remain. We won't know more about the crop yield for a couple more months. The harvest is not until late September, October. That's when you really might start getting more news about that. So another aspect that is playing a role on CPI that is slower to move and will allow it to remain more sticky is what's going on with rent prices. So rent and home costs, which is called shelter in the CPI, those are part of core CPI. So they're part of the less volatile, more sticky basket. They tend to move a bit more slowly. But the thing to really note, down here at the bottom, we're looking at year-over-year -year change. These blue bars are the median home price. The red line is rent. And the first thing you can really notice about rent going all the way back to the 60s is that it almost never falls. Rent very rarely ever comes down. Its rate of change might slow. It might be growing at a lesser pace than in years prior. But with the exception of 2010, there has been no period in the last 70 years where rental prices have fallen on an annualized basis nationwide. Now, there might be certain jurisdictions where that's not true, but on a nationwide basis, it doesn't come down. But the rate at which it rises does oscillate and it's heavily dependent on home prices, but on a severe lag. Part of that lag is because rentals tend to have annual contracts. They tend to be 12 or 18 or 24 months, so it's usually a year or two after home prices go up that rental prices start to absorb those impacts in full. It takes a little bit of time. Now, you can see sometimes the median home price does fall year over year. We have these pockets here in around 1970, here around 1990, obviously the great financial crisis, and in 2019 we had some depreciation in values. But broadly, they also rise. The more they rise year over year, the more it pushes up rental prices. But the curious thing about rent is that their rate of change, their positive rate of change, typically doesn't begin receding and declining in rate of change terms until after the median home price has gone flat or negative on on a year-over-year -year basis. So look at the rental price here. In the 70s, the value year-over-year -year is continuing to rise. It's growing at a quicker percentage pace year-over-year -year as the values of homes are exploding. But here around 1980, when the real estate market really slowed down and home prices came down to basically flat year-over-year. -year. This was the first of the two double-dip recessions when Paul Volcker raised interest rates up to like 20% to try to slay the inflation dragon. That was this period of time right here. When home prices stopped going up, the value of rent on a year-over-year -year basis started to grow less quickly. You see that it slowed down and it started to come down. This trend, similar to 1980, exists elsewhere. It happened here in 1990. Same thing. Home prices go negative year-over-year -year, and that is when the pace of rental price growth began to slow down. But you'll note it did not go negative. Same thing over here. Great financial crisis crisis, really about 2006, 2007, home prices started to decline year over year. The median value started to come down. And that is when we saw rental costs begin to decline. And we saw the first actual reduction in rental costs year over year for this value. It occurred right here. But what's going on now? We've got a historic rise in median home prices. And what is happening? Rental prices are rising on a lag as we have seen them to do historically. And the rate of change of rent rental prices is now higher than it has been at any point going all the way back to around 1987. This is another element that will put tailwinds on CPI, particularly core CPI, which is the more sticky, more lethargic aspects of the consumer basket. Those prices don't move as quickly. They don't jump around as much. They're affected by larger parts of the economy. And we're seeing rental prices rising very swiftly. So if we take that idea that home prices really need to fall on a year-over-year -year basis before we can see rent begin to slow down and start to have less of an impact on CPI, let's look at median home price on quarterly rates of change. So this is showing the median home price and how much it has changed in dollar terms in the last year, the last nine months, the last six months, the last three months. And what you can see here on a yearly basis, the median home 
price is up about $57,700. That's a lot. That's almost as much as the median income, which is around $68,000. In fact, there was a point in late 2021 where median home prices rose more in a single year than the median household income. You can see that right here. The latest value I've got on median household income is from 2020. It was 68,000. The highest value on this series is 2019 at 70,000. And in Q3 of 2021, the median home price was up more than $74,000 a year. So we've discussed this dynamic once before on a video on this channel called the reverse wealth effect, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. It really outlined what I believed the Fed's strategy was going into the summer. I think that video came out in May. Highly recommend you check that out if you're curious to see this chart and more related to it. But we're looking at home price changes in various quarterly periods. And what it's really showing is that we need to see the median home price fall by about $58,000 over the next few months before it starts to seem realistic that we would see the rate of change of rent then begin to slow down. Because as we just explored historically, the rate of change of rent doesn't begin soft until homes are actually losing values from the top. And seeing as we are currently at an extremely elevated level of year-over-year -year change for home prices, it may be some time before this gets down here. So it's yet to be seen how this will play out, but it does look like we're some time away from seeing rent soften as a factor on CPI. Now, the last thing we really need to cover as far as inflation goes are energy costs. Here we're looking at the crude oil price. It broke down from from the invasion high down here below $90, but it has been climbing again. And I think it's about 10 or 13% off the lows. Let's look here. Yeah, about 13% off the lows here from mid-August. And energy prices, like food prices, are very volatile. They move around a whole lot and they have an outsized impact on the CPI calculation. And one thing that is really keeping me on the edge of my seat as far as energy costs go, this chart here, which may be familiar to you if you saw my previous video called the support holds or lights out. I'll leave a link down below to the most recent video I put out where I talk about this near the end of the clip. And what this is showing is forecast UK household energy prices and how quickly they are expected to rise as we get later into the winter months. Now I know that this is not the United States. This is not a factor in US CPI directly. However, energy prices in the UK and in the Eurozone Zone will have an impact on what happens in the United States, particularly as we share global energy supplies and fight over what's left. Our energy security, Europe's energy security, the UK's energy security, all of them are big question marks right now. And when you see what these forecasts are showing over the next few months for the UK, it gives you an idea of the kind of oil shortages we may be facing. This is also a product of natural gas, which is having its own complicated issues and these will wreak havoc on prices, on inflation readings, on central banks' desires to tighten, all of it. And it's important to talk about energy prices and energy production, right? Because if we don't address our core energy supply problems, our production shortages, then whenever the central bank gets done tightening, if they feel that they have to stop, if something breaks and forces them to stop, inflation is going to come roaring back because we haven't addressed the core issues that are causing it in the first place. The world has dealt with this before in the 1970s. So if we go back and we look at the 70s, right here in the center of your chart, this is the price of West Texas Intermediate Crude here in the 70s. You can see oil stayed around $3 a barrel for a really long time. And then in 1974, it jumped up. We had a little oil crisis here around 1973, 74. The price jumped up. There was a lot more tumult going on, particularly in Middle Eastern countries where there's a lot of oil production. And then in the late 70s, prices jumped again. We had an energy crisis in 1979 that was worse than the one in 1973. And what happened during the oil crisis in the 70s is something I tweeted about recently. Because when you hear a lot of the talk about what happened to inflation, the reason that it came down, people tend to give all of the credit to Paul Volcker. Even though he was only like the third Fed president who tried to battle inflation through rate policy. He's just the one who raised rates higher than any of them had before. But all throughout the 60s and 70s, 
rates. We raised rates numerous times to try to get them above inflation to see CPI come down only to watch it spike back up again. You can see that right here in the 70s. If I go back even further and you go look back in the 60s, let's go show you that as well. You can see inflation kept spiking, coming down, spiking again. And each time here, as the rate of change would soften, they would think they had dealt with the problem, that it was going to go away. And then it just came roaring right back. And the reason it kept coming back is because there wasn't enough energy. So when you're dealing with an acute energy crisis and you have an inflation problem, raising interest rates will only do so much. It will cause prices to come down in the short term, maybe because you kill some demand, you kill the economy, you force a recession. Yes, that can happen. If you see here in 1970, we had a recession, inflation fell. We had one in 1974, inflation fell. Neither of them solved the problem and it just got worse again. And it wasn't just because Paul Volcker raised rates to 20%. What actually happened throughout the middle and late 70s as a result of the energy crisis was a bunch of non-OPEC countries drastically increased their crude oil production. The UK discovered Forty's Field and started producing in 1975. Prudhoe Bay, Alaska started producing through the Transatlantic Pipeline in 1977. Massive Cantorell Field in the Gulf of Mexico started producing in 1979. And over the course of the 79 through 85 period, non-OPEC producers added over five and a half million barrels a day of crude production. That is what solved the inflation problem once and for all. It wasn't Paul Volcker raising rates because it had happened numerous times before and hadn't addressed the issue. It wasn't until the world forced themselves to increase energy production that they dealt with inflation. And when it comes to U.S. oil production, we are not investing in the future. Now, we could probably have an entire episode talking about why that is. There's been a lot of disincentives placed on the oil industry, encouraging them not to continue exploring and preparing for future future production capacity, because that actually takes a long time. It happens in a few steps. They need to discover a site, then they drill the well, and then they come back later and complete the well. And when they complete it, then they start using it and production begins flowing. And that happens before they get to the point where they need to actually use the wells. There's an entire investment process, a whole capex structure that occurs where they go and they prepare these sites long in advance. But that hasn't been happening over the last couple of years. Years. What we're looking at here are drilled, uncompleted wells. This is from directly from the EIA. This is U.S. data. Each of these colors represents a different region of U.S. oil production. One of the most important is the Permian Basin in West Texas. And what you're looking at here are drilled, uncompleted wells going back to 2014. And this is basically like queued up future supply. These are sites that they have prepared for production that they have ready to use. They're in the backlog. But as you can can see this value has been falling since the middle of 2020 and it's now down below 2014 levels and this is happening during a period of acute energy shortages and record high prices but the problem is the incentive structure doesn't fully exist for the oil and gas industry to be incentivized to go out and build a bunch of new wells so when I see something like this and I don't see this value curling back higher it suggests to me that the United States is soon going to run into an oil shortage of its own, and that will be a tailwind on energy prices. It's certainly to be volatile. It's probably not going to go in a straight line. We might have periods where it cools off, but this is something that takes years to rectify, and it's currently going in the wrong direction. Likewise, if we look at OPEC+, Plus, they've been missing their quotas for a long time now. This blue line, the dark line, represents OPEC's expected output. This red line is their actual output. Going back to 2021, you can see it's been trailing it. And then here around March and April, it really took a hit. And there is a massive deficit now. And, you know, I've seen a lot of reporting out there, particularly from the person who made this chart here. His name is Josh Young. He works for Bison Interest. He's an interesting follow on Twitter if you want to know more about the oil and gas industry. And basically, there's a lot of expectations that OPEC is pretty much at capacity. It's part of the reason they keep missing their quotas. It's one of the reasons they were not really interested whatsoever in increasing production when the U.S. asked. Maybe for other reasons as well, but it looks like maybe they don't have any more capacity. So if you have OPEC, it doesn't have any capacity. You've got the US not investing in drilled uncompleted wells. You've got UK energy price forecasts for the end of the year, like at four and five X. Well, buddy, I think inflation is going to be here to stay for a while. 
I don't think it's about to go away. I don't even think a recession will solve these problems because unless we create more energy supply, the moment demand comes back, we will have a problem. So when I look at this chart, which shows that even if nothing changed at all, if everything just froze at a moment in time and didn't move from now till Christmas, we would still have a 6% CPI reading. And then I consider everything we just explored, what's going on with food prices, the lag with rental prices, and the quickness that home costs are going up. When we see the lackluster investment in energy production by OPEC and the United States, and we compare that to what happened in the 1970s, and we think about how rate policy alone was not the reason that we cured the inflation problem. It was not what slayed the dragon all by itself. It was the increase of global oil production. When we think about all that, I really suspect that we are in for a sustained period of inflation being a problem. It might chop around, it might be volatile, it might not just go up and to the right the whole time, but I don't think we're going back to 2% inflation anytime soon. I don't even know if we're going to get back to 3 or 4%. We may be in a permanently higher regime, at least permanent meaning maybe the next five years, maybe longer. This will take considerable time to work through because everyone in the world is going through it at the same time. So when we talk about inflation, when you guys ask me, why isn't CPI going to come down? Well, I've expressed to you a number of ways that I think it won't, and we will need to get really lucky. We get some kind of a break in a positive way, some kind of good news about capacity. Maybe something happens to lighten up the situation in Russia and Ukraine, but that's looking exceedingly like a long shot. And that's what I wanted to talk about with you guys today. I wanted to deep dive inflation. If you have any questions or feedback for me, make sure to leave them in the comments below and I will review them. And that's where we'll leave things. Last couple of weeks in particular have been very volatile and I've noticed that some of my friends in the markets are a little weary. They're feeling the pressure and I hope that you guys are doing what you can to take care of your mental health at times like this. But I'm going to let you go. So until we chat again, take care of yourselves, friends. Take care of your families, find some time to get outside and touch some grass, get some sunlight, some natural vitamin D, and we will chat again in the very near future. I look forward to it. So until then, cheers everyone.